quickly talk about uh, how to capitalize on market volatility, uh, the passive investment pay. Uh, we have with us uh, Chintan Haria, the head of product and development and strategy at ICICI Prudential Asset Management Company. Uh, Chintan has more than 16 years of experience in the industry, uh, where he anchors the growth of new as well as existing product at ICICI. Uh, his core competencies include research, portfolio management, market intelligence, strategic asset allocation, for investors with and development of products across different platforms like mutual fund, PMS, AIF, and ETF. So welcome, Chintan. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, nice introduction. Thank you. Uh, we also have with us uh, Shankha Mukherjee, uh, Edu Coach at Paytm Wealth Academy. Uh, Shankha also has more than 20 years of experience in the financial market, uh, primarily as an investor himself. So, welcome, Shankar. Hey, hi, Nishar. Hi, everyone. Uh, guys, the format uh, of this uh, spaces would be simple. We have collected a bunch of questions uh, from our users. Uh, we will ask as many as possible with Chintan and Shankar. Uh, if you guys have any question, please feel free to put a direct message either to me or Shankar and we'll be glad to take that uh, with Chintan. Uh, so, Chintan, first question uh, from my end would be uh, for especially long-term wealth creation, if that's the goal uh, that any individual has, uh, what should one opt for? Uh, they should go for mutual funds as an investment method or they should pick up direct stock. Uh, what's your take on this? Yes, uh, this is an interesting conversation and it always happens when markets do extremely well in the especially the mid and small cap space so whenever there is this huge rally which happens in the markets in a short span of time like it has happened in the last 12 to 14 months this question does come up and uh, i normally have this analogy that if for example uh, we are not doctors and we fall ill it is about self medication versus going to a doctor and taking the prescribed medication now sometimes what we take as medication for ourselves can work but not always and that's where I would say that direct investing as a route requires you to do a lot of research. It's not like we can't self-medicate ourselves. We can, but we'll have to probably go through a lot of articles, study a lot about what is our disease and how the particular medicine is going to impact us. Similarly, if you do want to go the direct investing route, which I'm very happy that very, very many Indians are going that route. And it's something which is definitely a good sign from an India perspective in the long run. It is important to do all the homework, a lot of reading of annual reports, a lot of reading of what's happening in the competition, a lot of reading about the sustainability of the company and the risks. And then, you know, you'll be able to be successful. Otherwise, of course, in the last 12 months, whatever you picked up has done well. But markets are not always that, uh, let's say, you know, favoring in, in, in terms of giving returns across the board. And hence, this common question of mutual funds versus direct investing I would say that for most in most of us who are either having a career of our own outside of uh, markets, they could be doctors, they could be engineers, they could be people who have their own businesses. Uh, you will find it difficult to track your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, you know investments, and if you do have a skill set which can be potentially used in one of the sectors, it's fine. But to keep a track of all sectors is difficult, and hence I would say, while you should do direct investing because it teaches you a lot about financial investments. Most of the time, most people will make probably a better risk return trade off in the long run creation of wealth through the mutual fund route. And hence, I would say have a bit of both or let's say a majority in mutual funds, while direct investing should be something which should in some sense uh, satisfy your brain in terms of picking the right stocks and maybe some mistakes will be made. But yes, I would say predominantly since the fund managers and analysts who are doing this for a living from a mutual fund standpoint or any professional management of funds, that's better than trying to do it yourself. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely right, Chintan. Even I personally prefer the you know, mutual fund and the ETF route that way. But you see, correction in the market is a great opportunity in the long run. And especially for young investors, our goals are for a very long period. Their retirement again is for a very long period later. Do you suggest that they take advantage of this fully? So, but, and if so, then how? Ideally, should they do it by 
an SIP route or in this kind of scenarios where the markets are correct, like 10%, 15% from the peak or 20% sometimes. So use lump sum. What do you suggest? So I would suggest the following. One, start as early as possible. Two, start with as little money as possible also. It does not really matter, right? I would say even if someone is college going or let's say just about just about probably studying to reach a particular career starting point, whatever money you do get, either as pocket money or you know your salary could be starting salary could be small, savings could be small. Start investing. You mentioned about systematic investment plan or lump sum. I would say for majority majority of the people, uh, you will find that you earn every month, you save every month, and out of the savings, you have to invest a little bit every month. So predominantly systematic investment plan will be the route which is the best route for most people. And the good news is, as you would have read today in the morning, that for the first time in India's history, the systematic investment plan in a single year, calendar year, has crossed 1 lakh crore. So that's something which is picking up. It's close to ten to 11,000 crore a month right now as we speak. In 2012-13, it used to be as low as 1,000 crore. So the per month systematic investment plan happening in mutual funds in India has crossed 11,000 crores. Just seven years back, it was less than 1,000 crores. So you can see the power of SIP which people are experiencing. And hence, systematic investment plan will work for you. Now, if the markets do correct 10%, 20%, 30%, should you be putting lump sum? Uh, yes, but it also depends the starting point from which the market falls. For example, if markets have gone up 150% in the last one and a half years, from being very cheap to now being slightly on the expensive side, a 10% correction may not warrant a very large investment at one go. You should not put everything in 10% correction, of course. So I would say for most investors, again, who do not know what is the valuation, what is right, what is wrong, are the markets too expensive or cheap, the best way for you to invest is through the asset allocation funds route, which is the balance advantage fund category, which we call. That should be the core. There is also the entire passive bouquet which is there or ETFs and index funds where you can do systematically accumulation of the units. But a core portion of your wealth, you can start investing in balance advantage fund category. And this category basically invests more money in equities when the markets are cheap and reduces your equity when the markets are expensive. So you get the benefit of buying low, selling high and you get the benefit of long-term wealth creation through the balance advantage fund category with lower volatility and probably lower volatility also would mean you will basically stay invested for the long run because I think most investors in India, it is said that the market returns is not equal to the, uh, it is said that the market return is not equal to the returns made by the investor. And the main reason for that is that investors do not stay invested across the market cycle. Whenever markets fall, uh, you would have seen Sankha, in fact, people actually take out money instead of putting yes. it. And that is the biggest biggest wealth destructor in the hands of all of you. If the markets do invest, and if the markets do badly and you take out money, it is something which is exactly opposite to what you should be actually doing. But it is exactly the emotional element of human beings that when you see money being lost, it pains you and you start feeling that I will lose more money and you take out money from the markets. This is probably the only place in which if markets or stocks are available at a discount, people do not rush in, people rush out. Everywhere else, courtesy the billion dollar sale days these days, whenever there is a sale, people rush in and buy those goods and commodities on the digital platform, which is great from an Indian consumer perspective. But in the markets, if there are billions of dollars sold by the uh, investors, uh, that is not bought out by the other investors who are waiting on the sidelines. So I think that is something which is important. Buy low, sell high. And that's where invest a large sum of your money in balance advantage fund category. Thank you. Chintan, here, uh, I think what you said is very true. People who sell, I mean, sell low, people who sell low, especially the retail population, they always wait on the side that market to it nifty mein nikala, nikal diya sab. 
अभी बारह हजार तेरह हजार चौदह हजार पंद्रह हजार में क्या लेना सो आई थिंक फॉर दिस कैटेगरी लाइक यू सेड एंड एसेट एलोकेशन फंड रियली मेक सेंस Yes, and I just also highlight right that uh, people always say, or people these days have this fascination, right? Sixty thousand market, will it go to one lakh? Is forty thousand cheap? Is eighty thousand expensive? Uh, will we ever go to one lakh? I just like to probably stretch this discussion a bit and explain to investors what ultimately is meant by a Sensex level of sixty thousand or a Nifty level of eighteen thousand. It will also help you to basically appreciate. that there was a time back in when i joined 16 years back that sensex was probably 6000 nifty was probably 2 3000 and sensex was 7 8000 so uh, it seems like a long long time ago but the fact is that sensex and nifty are nothing but barometers of the indian economy in other words they reflect the top 50 and 30 names of the stock markets uh, the companies and what are these companies these companies are selling goods and services to you it could be technology companies it could be fmcg companies it could be uh, oil companies right uh, these companies are selling yes. goods and services to you they are reflection they are reflection of the indian economy so if the indian economy was in 2008 45 lakh crores today it is 250 lakh crores i'm speaking in lakh crores so that i don't confuse you that it was 1 trillion dollar then Three trillion dollar now, rupee dollar has depreciated from forty five to seventy five. Forget all of those calculations. We were a forty five lakh crore economy in two thousand eight. That is the sum total of the goods and services produced in the year two thousand eight. The financial year was forty five lakh crores, right? And today we are at two hundred and fifty lakh crores of GDP. So effectively, the companies. Goods and services sold in the economy have gone up from forty-five lakh crore to two hundred and fifty lakh crore. Now, obviously, in line with the growth in the sales, which is two hundred and forty-five lakh crore becoming two hundred and fifty lakh crore, the profitability has also increased, and that profitability increase is reflected in the Sensex levels because Sensex levels are nothing but market values of companies, and market values of companies is nothing but the valuation given to the profits that these companies make so over a period of time you would have seen that for example 10 years back a packet of bread a very simple example a packet of bread would cost you um 12 rupees maybe 14 rupees today we pay about 25 26 rupees so obviously the costs for that person who is making bread have gone up in terms of wheat cost etc but the sheer sale price going up from 12 to 24 rupees would have meant that instead of earning 1 rupee that person is earning 2 rupees and this is reflected across all the uh, various sectors right if you were buying a car if you are buying uh, let's say detergent soap everywhere the profits increase as the markets keep on growing uh, in absolute terms and that is reflected in the sensex being 21000 in 2008 peak 60000 today and like i said if you stretch this 250 lakh crore over the next 5 years we will be a 400 lakh crore economy which is roughly about 5 trillion dollars and the profits would also increase which will reflect into our sensex being either 80000 90000 one lakh i don't know will there be volatility in between the answer is yes but for all the viewers or listeners it is important to know that as our economy grows and as all of us that is you and me save and invest in the market uh, the markets have probably one direction in terms of the numerical value but in between because of greed and fear because of all of us decide to sell in the market the markets will fall and there will be few wise buyers among you who when the markets fall buy you will be the ones who will be basically wealthier and hence out of every 100 people who invest in the markets one or two make money probably the rest don't because the rest don't know the value of patience thank you thank you any absolutely to chintan um also like uh, as you also said ki the markets are uh, at a higher valuation at a higher valuation currently uh, what kind of asset allocation would you recommend to our audience like what should be our uh, terms of percentage in terms of equity and so on yeah so if we look at that number that number can be easily gauged from our asset allocation funds like the balance advantage fund which we have uh if we look at that fund uh, the allocation is around the 35% mark today and the fund ranges from 30% at the lower end to 80% at the higher end 
So March 2020, when the markets fell very sharply because of the COVID-19 uh, virus crisis, we had invested uh, in that fund from 50% to 80% roughly. And that 80% as the markets kept on going up, we kept on booking profits and have brought it down to 35. So to answer your question today, in terms of where the markets are, where the valuations are, a 35% in equity and the balance in debt for conservative investors is something uh, which our models are showing. Uh, it does not mean that uh, it will be something which will fit all investors because there may be some investors who will probably be more risk taking. But yes, a ballpark number, 35% in equity, 65% in debt is the number which is comfortable right now. Thank you. And of course, uh, I would say 35% uh, in equity, 55% in debt and 10% in gold ETFs uh, may also be looked at because among all asset classes, gold is the forgotten asset class. Of course, if there are any questions on gold, I'll be happy to answer that. But in terms of allocation, I today truly believe that equity 35, uh, debt 55, gold 10% is something which can be looked at as a uh, as a conservative investor's uh, investment level in equities. Thank you. Great. Chintan, you spoke about gold now and about equity. Now, let's bifurcate equity into two categories, domestic and international. So, my favorite. So, what's your money? What's the weightage of Indian market cap compared to the global market cap? So, this is my first question. And along with that, it is like, if you look at the domestic versus international investment, how much of our equity exposure should be in... Uh, international funds and how much in domestic funds so first is the indian market cap to versus the global market cap in terms of percentage and the second is how much percent of our investments equity investments should be in international funds sure, sure. so uh, if we look at our market cap today it is three trillion dollars if you look at global equity market cap, all countries put together, it is 110 lakh crore, or sorry, 110 trillion dollars. And out of this 110 trillion dollars, the big daddy, so to say, is the American stock markets. American stock markets are at about 60 trillion dollars. This is just additional data for those who like to your data. So US is more than 50% of the global market cap, not surprising because it is the innovation capital of the world and most of the large companies are present there which are truly global. But India is just a speck in the ocean. 3% out of uh, you know the total market cap is in India. And uh, the question, the next question, uh, essentially how much allocation one should have to international equities and local equities. Given that, uh, and international equities, I'd like to break it up, right? So. We have a fund called the ICC Prudential Global Advantage Fund in which we are in, we allocate across international funds which are domestically uh, which are domiciled in India, and there we have a model to see whether emerging markets are cheap or uh, developed markets are cheap, and we allocate accordingly. Today, the tilt is predominantly in the emerging markets. In other words, countries in Asia other than India, be it South Korea, Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, are much cheaper than India. And hence, we would say that from an allocation perspective, uh, India should be around 75 to 80 percent and international investing can be 20 percent. And this international investing of 20 percent uh, should be tilted toward Asia rather than <coughs> U.S. Uh, while we do not, obviously, none of us will be able to understand all the companies which are there in Asia and, you know, different economies have different triggers. But given the valuation differentials that are there, where India is at 23, 24 times, while the Asian markets are at 12, 13 times, arguably India is growing faster. But 80% in India and 20% in international, and that 20% in international, either you invest it through one fund, which is the ICC Prudential Global Advantage Fund, or you basically invest it through um, individually in Asia or the Asian region, depending on how much ability you have to do the research. But yeah, Asia is looking cheaper. 80% India, 20% uh, international is a good number uh, as we speak today. Thank you. Chintan, uh, pe, like, so I'm thinking from an asset I mean, market valuation point of view. So let's say, for example, you're saying that globally the market valuations are very high, especially if you look at US, market cap to GDP, there is more than 200. 
whereas in India we are just a little above hundred. So as you said, the Asian markets looks cheaper. But again, there is something which you know keeps poking my brain. That is, if the valuations are high, then shouldn't we invest in the large caps? See, when we say markets are like overbought zone and. Should we not invest in large caps? And if not large caps, then why not US large caps? I'm just asking. Why not N hundred Nasdaq hundred fund or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So you you mentioned that US markets are roughly about two hundred and twenty percent market cap to GDP. Again, for those who like to your numbers, uh, US GDP is twenty trillion dollars, twenty one trillion dollars roughly. Uh, India is three trillion dollars, so US is six times our size in terms of GDP, and the US market capitalization, as we speak, is roughly about fifty-five to sixty trillion dollars. So, US market cap to GDP is in excess of two hundred and fifty percent versus its long-term average of hundred and ten. So, hundred and ten to hundred and twenty used to be the long-term average. Today, the US market cap is about two hundred and fifty percent. So, you can imagine it is at a hundred premium to its long-term average. Uh, yes, yes, I agree. That there are global companies and the likes of uh, Fang companies or Microsoft, Netflix, Google, Apple are such large companies which have an impact in all of our lives that they end up, uh, you know, garnering revenues from India, Africa, wherever they are, and that's why their market cap is captured in US. But still, if you look at from a, a risk reward perspective, past returns perspective. Uh, technology is thirty percent of the S and P five hundred uh, index weighted, yes. which is obviously also at its highs. So you mentioned about Nasdaq. Yes, they are one of the best companies. I cannot deny, but still, I wouldn't want to have US more than ten percent of my overall portfolio. It is a strong economy, but in terms of debt, in terms of fiscal deficit, in terms of uh, capacity utilization in terms of all the other measures which we see, they are not going to be able to grow so fast that they can justify their 21, 22, 23 times PE. The only reason why U.S. markets are sustaining in a big way is that interest rates in U.S. are so low at 1.5% U.S. 10-year yield. The interest rates are so low that you can justify a price-to-earnings ratio of 30 or 40 when interest rates are as low as that. If I was you, for example, and this will be my last minute on this question, yes. if I was you and I gave you 100 rupees and I told you, please allocate in the US market, either in debt, which yields you 1.5%, or in equities where the yield is 4%, 1.5 or 4, choose where you want to invest. Your returns are 4% in equity, 1.5% in debt. I'm sure most sensible, sane investors would say, let me go with 4%. Why should I keep my money in 1.5%? Yes. While the 4%, which is there in equities, obviously is volatile. Uh, but still, 4% and 1.5% is a big gap. So effectively, if US interest rates go up sharply, this 1.5% becomes 4 or 4.5% over the next 3-4 years, you will find the US markets compress in terms of their market valuations. And that will obviously lead to investors' wealth getting pained. And hence, I would say be very cautious on your incremental U.S. investment because you are investing at a time when for nine years, U.S. is the best performing market. I mean, if I look at nine-year period, uh, U.S. is one of the best performing or the best performing market. Uh, and the growth in U.S. is not going to be as fast as in India. U.S. will not grow beyond 3-4%. India is growing at 8%. Uh, so you can see the differential in growth. And valuation-wise, we are similar to US. And in terms of size, absolute size, we are much smaller. So we have a scope to grow much faster. So I would prefer India over US uh, in that sense. And hence, be cautious of your US investments. Keep your exposures limited. Uh, less than 10% in US for sure. It's, it's worrisome. You mentioned US as the large cap and uh, should you not think of it if the markets are uh, expensive and you should invest in large cap? I would look at it this way that, yes, if you do find the markets expensive in India, invest in the balance advantage fund category, which by definition has a large part in large cap right now. But don't think of investing or diversifying into U.S. in a very big way uh, because uh, that market 
uh, in terms of valuation it's even more expensive than india thank you thank you chintan for clarifying this now coming back to india so when we look at the nifty 500 in that uh, if you have to look at the market cap mix how much percentage is the large cap mid cap and small cap in terms of percentage yeah typically if you look at the 500 stock universe typically normally you have 70% in large cap 20% in mid cap 10% in small cap that's general rule of thumb the way uh, okay. the the market capitalizations are defined right now of course it is somewhere around 75% in large cap about 16% odd in or 17% in mid cap and about 8% in small cap but for listeners to make it easy consider it to be 70% large cap 20% mid cap and 10% small cap more or less that's a good ballpark to go by as far as the market cap breakup is concerned in the uh, bsc 500 or nifty 500 thank you thank you uh, also chintan how how is the mid cap index valued uh, compared to large cap and to small cap yes yeah, so if we look at the valuations of large mid and small today they have to an extent converged if i look at trailing earnings of course we are at about 25 26 times in both if i look at forward earnings we are at about 22 23 times in both so it's like mid cap small caps were very cheap in 2020 beginning because they had underperformed massively now with the kind of outperforms that we've seen just to highlight to the investors uh, or the listeners sorry from march 2020 to today the the large cap index has gone up roughly about 150% the mid cap index has gone up roughly about 190% the small cap index has gone up roughly about 234% so you can see the kind of outperformance that mid cap small cap has done since the bottom in march and hence as an investor you should be aware that from a valuation standpoint mid cap small cap large cap are all almost equal and only if india grows significantly in terms of its breadth or in terms of all the sectors doing well uh, can we justify mid cap small cap being a large part of your portfolio so to just to stay our as our allocation uh, models are telling us you should be around 80% in large cap and 20% in mid and small cap as we speak thank you thank you chintan see chintan uh, is it a good time to invest in a diversified fund or specifically in a mid cap or it uh, to, uh, the nse 500 for kind of fund diversified fund flexi cap fund or a mid cap focused fund yeah so i would say that for most investors the flexi cap fund category is a good category for the long run because there the fund manager will decide how much large cap mid cap small cap allocation needs to be done and fix the stocks within that that is the active part of it if in the passive category if i look at it most investors would probably end up getting the benefit of the entire market through the bsc 500 etf or the bsc 500 fund of fund which we have and that should take care of most investors requirement in terms of participating in the wealth journey like i said the bsc 500 would give you about 75% in large cap 25% in mid and small cap it has 500 names so all the names practically that you can think of are there in that and so much like what warren buffet has done a, a large part of his retirement or post retirement and i don't think he's going to retire but i think his trust money is lying in the yes. that's and, what he wrote in his will for his wife that after well, him it should be all in index funds in the market index funds yeah yeah correct so if if you look at it uh, globally also the largest fund is the s&p 500 fund and i think more than 4 trillion dollars of money is there in the s&p 500 uh, etfs of th- the two or three of the large players that are there the spider so in india also we, yeah so in india also we believe that bsc 500 in so the icsi substantial bsc 500 etf which is the passive fund which invests across 500 names or the fund of fund for those who do not have a demat account will do the job for most investors in terms of investing so the question was should we invest in flexi cap bsc 500 or a diversified fund i would say that for most investors having these three funds that is balance advantage fund as the core allocation flexi cap fund as the pure equity allocation and the bsc 500 fund as the market 
capture fund will do the job. So you can have 50% in balance advantage fund, 20% in flexi cap fund, 30% in BSE 500. I think at the end of the tenure of 10, 20, 30 years, you would be probably better off than maybe 70 to 80 percent of the investors maybe 90 percent of the investors so i think keeping it simple always works and through the flexi cap fund you get the entire gamut of large mid and small cap this is uh, how you how the fund manager uh, uh, approaches it and it also gives you that and of course uh, if you look at the balance advantage fund there also the fund manager can potentially take mid cap small cap so i think these three put together is like a beautiful uh, let's say soup Main okay. Main yeah. Main yeah. Great, great. Also, uh, Chitin, uh, any sectorial funds uh, which would you like to recommend for someone who is looking for a five or next 10 year as an invest investment horizon altogether? Yeah, so before I move to sectoral, I'd also like to highlight that mid cap and small cap funds as an allocation for systematic investment plan can be looked at uh, i missed out that point but in india because uh, india is a growth market uh, we've seen historically mid cap small cap funds uh, having high volatility but also giving higher returns because many of them end up you know uh, going multiple x over the over the course of 10 years 20 years and hence having mid cap small cap exposure is also extremely important you can do that through the uh, index funds route also you have index funds in mid cap and small cap as well so from a investor standpoint i believe that sip that is systematic investment plans in mid cap small cap is also a great way to invest and uh, they should not miss that out uh, i'll move to your question now uh, can you please repeat the question thank you uh, so basically Chitin, i was asking ki what what kind of sectorial funds an yeah. investor look for yeah. if he has like five ten years of horizon yeah so typically if you look at sectoral funds and thanks for asking that question uh, india has seen many sectors uh, grow over the last 10 20 years we are one of the let's say countries where we are blessed with so many sectors which are world beating and because of our sheer size and scale uh, those sectors are growing uh, of course we all know that probably 3,000 years back, we were 30% of the global GDP. Today, we are only 3%. But I think we are gaining ground in terms of capturing a large part of the global GDP through our technology-savvy uh, uh, engineers or tech-savvy engineers who are basically ruling the roost in terms of the entire outsourcing boom that we are seeing. So from virtually $0 billion uh, in revenue about 30 years back, we are $180 billion in the tech outsourcing that we are getting. That's 8% of our GDP. It's not a small number. So we are the world's largest tech outsourcing country. We are the world's largest pharmaceutical medicine export uh, country. We are the fourth largest automobile consuming country. We are the second largest in terms of steel and cement, if I'm not mistaken. We have a banking industry where it is uh, well regulated as well as a uh, few large players growing significantly. We have insurance companies getting listed now. Uh, I think the list of sectors in India which are there, be it real estate, be it, uh, you know, even old economy con con companies in manufacturing, etc. have now started to do well. So textile chemicals which had lost ground are coming back. So basically, to cut the long story short, in India, all the sectors are doing well. But I would say that from a risk-reward perspective today, uh, the domestic focus sectors like banking, infrastructure can do well with India's growth, while the export-oriented sectors like pharmaceuticals and technology have been one of the best wealth creators in the last 30 years. And I don't see a reason why they won't be uh, wealth creators in the next 30 years also. And so I think even FMCG as a sector where the valuations are expensive and hence I did not speak about, the growth will be there, but the valuations there are not sustainable or they are not probably justified today and hence I did not speak about it. But technology and pharma, the valuations are reasonable. They are not out of hand. And banking and infrastructure are two spaces which I like. Uh, and the last part which I like is the entire PSU space or the public sector enterprise space. It's not a sector sector, but as a theme, that looks extremely interesting because it's cheap and they've got high dividend yield, especially in this low interest era. 
I think that is something which investors should possibly look at as well. Thank you. Uh, definitely. Uh, uh, also, I, I just I just want to repeat on uh, you would have already answered this question earlier. Uh, but like, what do you suggest active or passive funds, which like probably makes more sense to most of our audience currently? Yeah, so it's like this. Uh, the same question comes in, right? OTT or cinema? Uh, do one does one stick to OTT or does one go to cinema? I okay. think both have a scope and role to play in terms of your entertainment because they provide you different experiences. Uh, similarly, if I look at active and passive, I never, never think of it as active versus passive. In India, which is a growth economy, there are so many mispricings which keep happening which the advantage fund manager can take. And hence, always, I believe it's active and passive. And uh, as viewers would know, active funds are where fund managers are buying, selling on their own in terms of their uh, sector or stock picks. While in passive, that is index funds and ETFs, you basically get what you get in terms of the um, replication of the underlying index. So I think 75% active, 25% passive, that's a good number to go by. Maybe 70% active, 30% passive. In passive, you will pick and choose basis your comfort. In active, there are also a lot of options. But yes, always think of it as active plus passive. Passive have their own advantages, like low cost, convenience. You exactly get what you want. You're not reliant on a fund manager to make the choices for you. However, in active, if you choose well, then obviously you can make a lot of money as well. Just to give an example, if in an active fund or you would have chosen an active fund, which was, let's say, a commodity fund in the last one year, you would have made a lot of money, right? So you can do that in the passive funds also, should there be a commodity passive fund at some point of time. But a fund manager who can move swiftly between various stocks and sectors can also do the job well for you. So at least as far as India is concerned right now, a 70% active, 30% passive is a good number to start with. They will coexist. They will have their ups and downs. Uh, passives did extremely well between 2017 and 2020. 2020 21, Active has done very well because the market started giving wider spectrum of uh, stocks the return. And hence, I would say, have both in your portfolio. Uh, not necessary that you need to have either active or only passive. You should have active and passive both. Thank you. Uh, Chintan, I would uh, agree to you. We do agree with you on this. So from my, uh, I would like to add, share one of my personal experiences. Uh, when the market is growing, I have always observed that, and growing very fast, moving very fast, I have always observed that the passive funds outperform the active funds. But after a, after a certain point of time, when the markets are, let's say, overvalued by uh, analysts, analysis, I've seen there will be a point of time where the passive funds becomes flat and the active funds starts performing when in a falling market. Especially in a falling market, I've seen active funds outperforming the passive funds there. But at the same time, like you said, there are charges and all that. So what are the different... I mean, this is just what I shared when I personally experienced. So do you think... 70, 30, uh, 70, uh, 20 to 30 percent in active and uh, sorry, 20 to 30 in uh, passive and the rest in active. It's good for people who und uh, doesn't understand the market, but people who understand and who try to time the market for them, do you recommend a higher exposure in passive funds or maybe index funds? Yeah, I think if you do understand the markets, then uh, undoubtedly, uh, maybe in March 2020, you would have been attracted towards a small cap index fund because that looked compelling. You would have been attracted to commodities fund that would be compelling. But uh, yes, can they have a larger allocation if you have your own ability to pick? The answer is yes, because if you have your own ability to pick, then you would want to obviously pick uh, a low cost offering within the passive space, which does the job as far as capturing the market. So it could be the mid cap 150 index. It could be the small cap 250 index. And if you pick those, you end up getting the benefit. It could be the 
in technology ETF also. It could be the, in fact, last one year, one of the best performing funds is the technology ETF. So yes, someone who is in the self-select mode and is able to understand markets, you can potentially do it yourself and do it through the passive fund and hence have a higher allocation to passive. But I think most people do need some advice. Most people do have some, uh, let's say, uh, constraints in terms of following the markets, be it because of their inexperience or because of the lack of time. And then 70-30 works well, wherein the 70% you can have it in balance advantage fund, flexi cap fund, mid cap, I mean, something like that, which is diversified. And the 30% you can yes. pick and choose uh, in the other categories on the passive side. Thank you. And there is a new category, actually, when we are talking about weak sectors. Like I have been observing that uh, you have been sometimes giving examples of certain sectors. So if I am a believer of sectors, like, you know, I, I don't know which stocks will perform or which sectors will perform. Do you suggest that as investors, we can also look at the business cycle kind of fund category? Is the business cycle funds have been coming up? nowadays even i believe you also have one yeah yeah so uh, again see uh, takes away our headache there, there, there are there are there are various solutions created for investors to participate in the market in uh, you know by the asset management companies we came up with the business cycle fund i think in january 2021 so yes, we're yes. Probably, I think we're january probably january yeah. Yeah, we're this year. probably this year. This yeah, year. January, January 2021. Yeah. So we'll probably be touching a year of, uh, let's say, anniversary in January 2022. Our thought process was very simple that if investors want to invest, someone like, uh, let's say, for example, if I have young children or if I don't have any responsibilities as such immediately and I want to invest in a fully invested fund for the long run, for the long run and really long run, uh, why not have a fund which bases macro? Because what has happened in the world is in the last 15 years, because of central bank interventions, because central government policies and uh, everything that's happening in the world is correlated because the world is one financial market, so to say, because of digitization and information technology and the, the new spreads at the rate of, uh, I think, lightning. Uh, it is very simple to basically have a product which actually keeps moving between aggression and defense in a fully invested form. And that's where the business cycle comes in. Just to highlight to the investors, in our presentation one year back in the business cycle fund, we had said India's business cycle is looking good. When we say business cycle, we basically mean that India's outlook as a country for growth seems to be good. So your domestic focus sectors like capital goods, like construction, like banks, will do well. And hence, in that particular fund, since the last one year, we've been having a position of being on the side of domestic Indian sector doing well, including metals to an extent. Should the fund manager have a negative view on the markets or negative view on India and feel that the business cycle is turning for the worse, the fund manager will move into technology, FMCG, pharmaceutical, as the case may be. So yes, uh, with the kind of expertise that the fund management team brings in, business cycle funds also make sense for the investors uh, who want a fully invested fund to be part of their portfolio and which can attack and defend depending on the market cycles based on the macroeconomic parameters. And I think macroeconomics is playing a bigger role in our uh, world today and that's where uh, I think business cycle funds will come in handy for those who want to invest in a fully invested fund and attack and defend across market cycles. Thank you. Thank you, Chintan. Uh, so, uh, Chintan, also uh, what kind of historical returns that we have seen, especially in mid-cap index and what can one expect in next 5 to 10 years? Yeah, so if we look at it, uh, and I'm just looking at the data in front of me, if we, if you look at the Indian markets and the, uh, let's say the large cap, mid cap, small cap component, uh, clearly over five years, over 10 years, uh, the mid cap component 
by courtesy or virtue of mid caps doing well has done one has done better in fact than the nifty or the large cap and the small cap so the mid cap component in terms of returns over 5 years 10 years has done better than the large cap and small cap component not surprising because small caps obviously have a lot more mortality or a lot more volatility as well while mid caps are those potential companies which end up having a uh, let's say move up in terms of the ladder and become large cap so mid caps are slightly stronger and they've shown over the last 5 10 years that they have done well uh, compared to small cap and large cap uh, and in terms of valuation metrics also if i see today um mid caps and small caps are almost similar priced and hence probably mid cap is standing out as an investment avenue i would say for most investors if you want to participate in the next big story in india in terms of the blue chip and i just like to give one example 20 25 years back uh, we did not have any technology company as such uh, being part of the mainstream indices except for maybe uh, we uh, one 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 of the large uh, tech companies which is today because technology was or maybe if i go to 1990 for sure there was no technology company because technology sector did not exist in india and today if i see technology is almost 18% of the market index so you can see that technology has become such a large part of the large cap indices but many of these companies through the last 30 years were part of the mid cap companies and you by virtue of being invested in the mid cap 150 index you would get an exposure to these companies at an early stage so if you want to participate in the winners of tomorrow uh, or the large cap companies or the blue chip companies of tomorrow the mid cap 150 is the right space to be in it is slightly volatile compared to large cap but if i have a very long term history and if more importantly i have the ability to buy more when the markets fall then it is a very good companion that investors can have and i think a systematic investment plan in mid cap for the long term and when i say long term it's 10 years 20 years and most of the listeners if they are listening and they start early they'll truly see the benefit in the long run of making big money in the mid cap space through the sip route thank you yes chintan that's amazing now if chintan someone would have done an sip in a mid cap index for the let's say last 10 to 20 years how much he would have made or maybe a mid cap fund how much he would have made in long run yeah so we are just looking at i mean the data from a return perspective um as on 12th december which is about 4 days back if someone had done a sip for 10 years in the mid cap fund they would have roughly got a return of 20.94% let's say i'm rounding it off to 21% versus a nifty return of 15.5%. So this is at an index level. So at an index level nifty if you done an SIP for 10 years you would have made 15.5%. In mid cap you would have made 21%, in small cap you would have made 18.5% or roughly 19%. So uh if I look at 10 years, if I look at 5 years and if I look at even 15 years or 15 so if I see uh mid cap has given 18% return versus a nifty of 13 and a half and a small cap of 15 and a half. So clearly the objective is met if i have an sip in mid cap fund because the volatility is lesser while the return capture is higher in terms of comparison with small cap so i wouldn't say the differential is uh, big in terms of how it sounds but over a 15 year period a uh, 17% cagr versus a 15% cagr is a mind blowing difference in terms of returns and uh, if you convert it into absolute numbers you will find that it's a very big sum for a 2% cagr difference over the last 15 years so i think that's where mid caps stand out as a option to invest for an sip route thank you thank you chintan uh, thanks a lot chintan uh, so chintan we are at the last of uh, packing of this session uh, so any last piece of advice you want to give to our guests Yeah, so I think uh, my advice is probably something which I had covered last time as well when I did master class. Uh, unfortunately, in India, we are not taught finance in school, not taught finance in. 
the only time we learn finance is when the money we start investing and make mistakes so if we look at uh, sanka if you can mute yourself it will be good. yeah so if we look at it from a finance learning perspective uh, we should remember this very clearly that no one is going to teach us more than what the market can teach us and whatever i have spoken in the last one year and i thank ptm for giving me the opportunity to connect with all of you to twitter spaces uh is because of the 16 years of learning that i have had in icsa prudential asset management company through my different roles uh experience has taught me but it has not necessarily taught me everything as i learned in march 2020 that there can be pandemics and there can be fall so the only piece of advice which i want to give and i unfortunately also learned it too late is the more you do it yourself in terms of investing in the markets through the mutual fund route you will learn a lot more you will also create wealth and if you wait for your investments and you keep waiting that will not help also do not listen to what the other person has done because it may not fit you you have to realize what is your taste what is your risk appetite and then invest and the simple aspect of life reading is everything and if you can devote time to reading and i will admit it myself i have devoted much lesser time to reading than i should have i devoted a lot more time to cricket which i don't regret because being a cricket fan i have lots of memories of watching cricket live across through the generation of tendulkar virat kohli and and, and so on and so forth and of course ms uh, dhoni in between but uh, i mean those are happy memories right we need to have a hobby but yes uh, do read books do read books uh, there are fantastic books in simple language which are there and uh, uh you should definitely inculcate the habit of reading books as much as you can and uh, there are few books which are you just google top 10 finance books just read them and you are done in terms of uh, knowing at least basics that you should do and read as much about warren buffet that you can do reach as much about let's say successful people like peter lynch that you can do i think that will solve a lot of your long term uh answers or questions in one hour i'll not be able to do justice to all the questions but if you do spend time in reading about warren buffet reading seeing what he's done and the likes of peter lynch uh i think and many others there's a long list you will end up enriching yourself and also learning a lot and i have learned a lot from books myself and also the markets and i've been lucky that i have been part of this organization which has given me the platform to actually see market so closely and pay me for that as well so thanks a lot uh, for having me on the show it's always a pleasure and wishing everyone a great uh, as well we are very close to that i am myself going on a holiday from tomorrow so in some sense it's a send off for me thank you sir thank you chintan chintan i just did a small calculation i thought let me share this you told me like uh, your last 50 years nifty has given an average for your sip is rated of 13% and um, your mid, mid cap has given a return of 17% the amount looks very less but when you actually put it in number i did this calculation right now in nifty sip you would have made 49 lakhs around and mid cap sip you would have made 72 lakhs the difference is of 23 lakhs that's phenomenal yes like i said if you compound that 2% over 15 years and see yes. the absolute term so thanks for doing that calculation i didn't have it handy Yeah, I'm just doing it in my Excel. It, it is, it is, it is phenomenal what the power of compounding does. Even a one percent extra, and that's where, in fact, that's where if that one or two percent uh, wealth, extra wealth, can be generated over long periods of time through smart asset allocation, and more importantly, by not losing money. Uh, it's also important, right? Warren Buffett says, first rule: don't lose money. Second rule: don't forget the first rule. In other words. 
don't invest where you don't understand. Two, don't invest where the returns have been probably better than most people can digest. And hence, uh, be very careful of allocating to any asset class which has done phenomenally well and you don't understand the valuations or you don't understand that asset class itself because financial world is known to have its own bubbles. And honestly, I don't want any one of the listeners to get sucked into the bubble and lose money, right? If you don't make too much money, it is fine. But if you lose money, it's very difficult to come out from that loss, both emotionally and financially. So be careful of that. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Chintan. Thanks a lot, Chintan. It's uh, always a pleasure to host you. Uh, I will just take two more minutes just to highlight few points and more important points that you have spoken about. Uh, you talked about start early, even if, if it's a little capital, save every month and invest a part of it. Uh, when you're looking about your portfolio, think about 35% in equity, 10% in gold and 55% in debt. Uh, that's for a conservative investor. And as far as your risk appetite, you can further go ahead. Uh, US markets are also at like very all time high. So one should not take a high exposure there, not more than 10%. Uh, banking and infrastructure are two key sectors to look forward. And PSU as a theme is important for an investor. Uh, as an investor, one should also look about 70% uh, funds in active funds and 30% uh, money into passive funds because we are a high growth economy altogether. Uh, someone who is looking to invest in the next uh, blue chip companies uh, for a 10, 20 years of horizon uh, should look at mid cap index. Uh, more importantly, always keep it simple because simple things work. Uh, no one can teach us what market can actually teach us. So more you do yourself in terms of investing uh, in the market through mutual fund way, the more you learn and you will eventually create wealth for you. Uh, reading is one of the most important habit. Uh, one should read as much as possible. And lastly, you talked about don't invest in what you don't understand and don't invest in something which is already in a bubble. You know, so thanks a lot, Chintan, for this key learning. Thanks a lot, Shankar. And thanks a lot, everyone, uh, for listening to us. Thank you. You summarized it so well. May I please request you to send it to me in, in some form or the other. It's such a brilliant summary of the discussions. So, so the viewers the viewers or the listeners will think, one hour we had to listen to something which could have been told to us in 80 seconds. Thanks a lot for the summary. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Chintan. I think Chintan, the best part which I like, you know, the ideal life is pursue your hobby, do your work, day-to-day -day work, Read books if you want to learn about investment strategies of Warren Buffett and all. And don't do anything. Give your money to your fund manager. Or you yourself invest in passive funds and enjoy life to the fullest. This is my takeaway, personal takeaway. Chintan. Thank you, Nishar. Thank you. Thank you. Square and Thank you. Hobbies are important. They will allow you yes. to live life. In a nice way, and uh, especially in times of COVID, where things have not been the best for many people, I think hobbies have kept people alive in every way that we can. So we, we in India, in India, unfortunately, we are moving from a joint family to a nuclear family system, which obviously takes away the the benefit for most people of having a family around you in a very big way. Uh, that's the nature of how we are progressing or evolving. Uh, for the generation that I come from, having a joint family has obviously helped a lot in learning a lot of values like saving, like ensuring yes. of everyone. And uh, saving as a virtue is being forgotten. It's easy to spend money, very difficult to make money. So if you have made money, save it, invest it smartly, and you will have a better life as you move along. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.